Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. It is Wednesday. Glad you are with us on the Three Martini Lunch. Your stool is ready. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today. All of it brought to you by Gabby. G-A-B-I dot com slash martini. Take just two minutes to find out how much you can save on your car and homeowner's insurance. Gabby dot com slash martini. More on that a little bit later. Jim, let's talk about our good martini today. And it's one of those situations where the underlying issue isn't good, but the fact that attention is being called to it is good. There was a Supreme Court decision that came down on Monday related to whether or not the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits, among other things, of course, discrimination based on sex. And of course, in 1964, that meant uh, women should not be discriminated against in the workplace. Well, according to the Supreme Court on Monday, that includes uh, claims of discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. But regardless of how you feel about that particular decision, and Josh Hawley has strong opinions on that too, the Missouri senator has another problem that I think we need to call attention to here. I think it's probably both parties, really, but Republicans have gotten to this point where they're too timid to really do anything legislatively, and they're just confident that if they just appoint enough judges that seem to have conservative resumes, that everything will work out just fine. So while Holly is concerned about the ramifications of the decision on Monday, he also spent quite a bit of time talking about this issue on a floor speech yesterday. Here's what he said. Every honest person knows that the laws in this country today, they're made almost entirely by unelected bureaucrats and courts. They're not made by this body. Why not? Because this body doesn't want to make law. That's why not. Because in order to make law, you have to take a vote. In order to vote, you have to be on the record. And to be on the record is to be held accountable. And that's what this body fears above all else, Madam President. This body is terrified of being held accountable for anything on any subject. So can we be so surprised that where the legislature fears to tread, where the Article I body, this this body that is charged with the Constitution for legislating, refuses to do its job, courts rush in, and bureaucrats too. Are they accountable to the people? No, not at all. Do we have any recourse? Not really. Now what must we do? Well, now we must wait to see what the super legislators will say about our rights in future cases. So, Jim, I think it's pretty hard to argue against that. Uh, He's essentially arguing that people are too timid. They don't want it on their records, particularly if the issue is controversial. That's why all these things seem to end up at the Supreme Court, because legislators who should be the ones amending the Civil Rights Act, if it's going to be amended, are too timid to actually do so. They don't want the controversy. They'd rather just ignore it. And that way the court becomes super legislators, which is exactly what the founders didn't want. Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting. We have judges who want to be legislators, uh, (laughs) legislators who want to be in the executive branch, uh, people in the executive branch who apparently want to be in the fourth estate. They want to be in media. They see their jobs as, you know, basically commentating. Paraphrase, I think it was a Chris Rock movie where he said at the account of three, everybody go back to where you're supposed to be since everybody was shifting around from one place to another. What I think of in particular is back when Obama signed one of his executive orders on DACA, and after insisting for years and years that he didn't have that power and authority and it was going to require legislation to address this and that he couldn't simply do this, I believe it was Sheila Jackson Lee and a couple other members of Congress who started introducing and had big public press conferences to announce potential executive orders that they were drafting for the president to sign. Right. They apparently gotten bored with the job of being in Congress. They have they have this ability to introduce legislation and your job, you know, you're supposed to try to persuade a majority of your colleagues to say, hey, yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, I'm going to do that. And hopefully, you know, we can work some out. But apparently at some point this became just too hard for people. Right. And I guess the flip side of this is that never mind it being hard. They also find it, you know, politically risky that if they actually said what they thought, they might lose re-election. Their constituents would not like that. Now, the thing is, is that the main question comes down to, is your job to pursue what you think are the right policies, regardless of whether or not they're popular and regardless of whether or not your constituents want it? I think most of us would agree if your constituents are resolutely opposed to an idea, it's probably not a terrific one. Your job is to represent them. You probably should listen to them. But then again, there are probably circumstances where the right choice, probably on say something like entitlement reform, 
uh, is not necessarily going to be popular, but it's going to be necessary. And, you know, continually kicking down the can down the road will be the popular option, but won't necessarily be what's best for the country in the long run. But nobody really wants to grapple with any of that. They want to say things that are nice. They want to say that their legislation supports kittens and puppies and, and all the happy stuff. And whenever a thorny issue comes along, you know, I think there's now a pretty broad cultural consensus in this country that you should not discriminate in hiring or other uh, hiring or other employment decisions based on sex. But what about someone who, you know, was born a man and now says, well, I'm a woman, or I feel like a woman some days, and I feel like a man other days, or I feel like something in the middle, or I'm fluid. I believe I don't identify with any of those things. This idea that I don't know if it was Facebook or something that said they had 27 different options for gender. By the way, no one ever asked Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden how many genders there are. It'd be kind of fun to watch them stammer and have them suddenly you know, freak out about that. So you have this circumstance where the decisions, you know, the le- either the legislation is written a certain way, presidential signing statements might say, well, I as president have decided I'm going to interpret the law this way and I'm not necessarily going to enforce that part of the law. And then, of course, gets kicked over to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court says, you know what? We don't like what any of you said. Here's what we've decided the law says. You know, if everybody wrote the laws clearly in the first place, this wouldn't really much of an issue. But uh, uh, and I think it's kind of become a, a the, the, the constitutional conservatives are right on, on the text, no pun intended, and are right on paper when they say, well, clear writing of laws in the first place would avoid many of these problems. But it requires an executive branch willing to carry out those laws. And I kind of wonder if consensus, you know, oftentimes building a consensus may require lack of specificity in certain aspects of the, the details of the law. We will allow the executive branch to uh, specify this. So maybe these sorts of fights are inevitable, but this general sense of accountability through government, as we know who, who, who wrote the law which way, who interpreted the law this way, and the role of judges to say, no, the law was written this way, this is what it must mean, this is the way it must be. Um, took a shot this week. And it's very surprising to see Neil Gorsuch, one of the people who is, uh, uh, has folks on the right tearing their hair out, kind of make something of that, that whole but Gorsuch argument uh, in defense of the Trump administration for, for the first couple of years, a little, uh, a little ironic now. Um, I mean, conservatism will survive. Conservatism will go on. It is nice to see at least one Republican senator calling this out and saying, hey, you know what? We got to write clearer laws. We got to write specifics, and we can't let the courts come along and say, "Hey, we've decided the court law actually means something totally different than what it was uh, actually intended when it was written." Absolutely right, and you know, confirmation of judges is a major part of what the Senate does, and so we've uh, really appreciated Mitch McConnell making sure that neither rain nor sleet nor dark of night nor uh, pandemics or whatever have uh, prevented him from uh, leading the confirmation effort on some of these things. It is very important, but that's not the only job of the Senate. Uh, We've had frustration. I know I have had frustration over time that uh, because he knew he couldn't get to 60, he wouldn't bring stuff up for a vote. Yes, it's not going to get done, but you put people on the record and hopefully you move the ball forward in terms of public opinion on some of these issues. And we haven't seen that on a lot of different things. And a lot of folks believe that that two years of 2017 to 2019, yeah, we got tax cuts. Yeah, we've tried to do something about Obamacare. I'm not really sure uh, that they had a great strategy on that. But uh, I feel like a lot more legislative could have been done there, uh, even though you probably would have needed to get to 60 on most of the issues. But um, anyway, good words from Holly. Let's talk about Gabby. Speaking of tax cuts, we always like to have more money in the pocket. So let's talk about Gabby, because uh, right now we all want more money in our pockets. And when was the last time you looked at how much you're spending every month on car insurance or on homeowner's insurance? Now's the time to check out Gabby and see about getting a lower rate for the exact same coverage you already have. Gabby takes the pain out of shopping for insurance by giving you an apples to apples comparison of your current coverage with 40 of the top insurance providers like Progressive, Nationwide, Travelers. You just link your current insurance account and in about two minutes, you'll be able to see quotes for the exact same coverage you currently have. Gabby customers save $825 per year on average. If they can't find you savings like they did for so many customers, they'll let you know so that you can relax knowing you already have the best rate that's out there. And they will never sell your info so there's no more annoying spam or robocalls. And when they say two minutes, it really is just a couple of minutes. It's a uh, process of uh, several different prompts where you just put in vital information. Where do you live? Uh, What's your age? On and on and on. Eventually, you link to your current policy so they know exactly what you're already covered for. 
And then they essentially show you a whole laundry list there real quickly of what you would be paying with other policies covering the same thing. So a lot of people get to save. Other people uh, don't need to switch because they're already getting a good deal. And that's where I was. So no change needed there, but it's totally free to check your rate and there's no obligation. So take those two minutes right now to see how much you can save on your car and homeowner's insurance. Go to gabby.com slash martini. That's G-A-B-I dot com slash martini gabby.com slash martini all right jim let's move to our bad martini now and it's not often that nbc is in the good martini and they're not there again either today so yesterday the nbc news verification unit which is as others have said yesterday was very orwellian and i feel like we should have come up with kind of like a law and order svu type <laughs> i was just about to as soon as you said that i wanted to say dung dung <laughs> at nbc news there's fake news, and then there's trying to kill your competition. These are their stories. <laughs> and so, uh, so basically, they've decided that they wanted Google to stamp out the Federalist and Zero Hedge. Here's how you uh, paste it from Ad Week into the Morning Jolt today. Zero Hedge will no longer be able to use Google's ad platform to monetize its content as of last week. And the Federalist was warned about their comment section and was given three days to comply with Google's rules before the company ceased access to its ad platform. Google said the Federalist has since removed comments from its website after the company worked with them to address issues on their site related to the comment section. So what happened here, though, is that NBC News worked with some far-left organization, not in the United States, to essentially de-platform uh, internet sites that it considers far-right. I'll let our listeners decide whether the Federalist is far-right and get them kicked off and, and, and basically silence their voice. Because if you got no ad revenue, you're not uh, going to last too long. Yeah. So the first thing is that NBC News verification unit. I, first, I guess it sounds like it's some sort of um, fact checking part of NBC News, or that's what it sounds like. Uh, for those who don't know or are familiar with the Federalist, my guess is most of our listeners have heard of a conservative website set up by Ben Domenech. There are days I agree with their takes. There are days I don't. They have a variety of writers. Uh, our David Harsani used to uh, write for them for a lot of years. You know, th- what you think of them really shouldn't be an issue of whether or not they're allowed to run Google ads. And for those who don't know Zero Hedge, um, they're kind of a libertarian y, but mostly they're a financial and markets news site. They were very big beating the drums for the idea of a housing bubble. You know, they're not that political, um, but I guess periodically they say things that. Uh, Somebody over at the NBC News Verification Unit uh, objects to, or I guess more specifically, it was the Center for Countering Digital Hate, the CCDH, a British nonprofit that combats online hate. Now, what's interesting is, is that first of all, in this entire initial article, uh, first of all, before the article went up, uh, the woman who wrote it, uh, Adele Momoko Frazier, wrote this, this article and was kind of saluting them and talking about how they had worked together to get Google to demonetize these sites. So it, it basically indicated that like Google didn't notice there was something that they objected to at either of these two sites. They called Google's attention and saying, what are, you know, did you see this? What are you going to do about this? And you know, the initial statement from NBC News, the verification unit, was that these sites would be demonetized. And look, if you're not making money, you're probably, your, odds, your odds of staying in business are much less likely even in the world of, of opinion journalism and particularly conservative political journalism. But then the verification unit apparently didn't verify much of anything. The Adweek article says that, well, no, the Federalist had been warned, Zero Hedge had been told flat out, but they were flagged because of their comment sections. Oh, oh, <laughs> there you go. because the one thing that jumped out in that initial article on NBCNews.com was that there was no, like, usually, like, you know, uh, you know, controversy surrounds this publication because it ran X. And usually they mention what X is. And this article didn't specify it. It says it was racist, but it didn't specify what it was. And everyone's like, okay, well, what did they say? What, what actually was, I, I was reminded of um, one of the Me Too cases. Uh, the gentleman who, who used to work at New, New Yorker got dismissed, was dismissed. And the New Yorker refused to say what he had been accused of. And then it turned out that actually the it's another familiar story of he said, she said, and this idea that, you know, we're, we in the public were supposed to draw conclusions about someone without actually knowing any of the specifics of the wrongdoing at, at issue here. Uh, in the case of this, NBC News was basically like, we did fantastic work by getting Google to demonetize these two sites over things that were racist and no, you're not allowed to know what those things were. 
Now, the interesting thing is, is that, you know, uh, as you mentioned, this, this is occurring as there's been this ongoing debate, uh, left, right, and center, about Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which basically is you can't get sued for what somebody else writes on your platform. This applies to National Review Online. This applies to uh, Ricochet. This applies to uh, pretty much every major news site, as well as the big social media companies, Facebook and Twitter and all that kind of stuff. If somebody writes something on Twitter, you know, and, and it's, uh, you know, it's libelous or, or you, know, uh, so, you know, somehow otherwise unacceptable, you cannot hold Twitter or Facebook legally liable for what that person put up there. And, you know, there are a bunch of people who say, well, that gives these companies too much protection and, you know, encourages an irresponsibility and all that stuff. And lots of other folks say, wait a minute, wait a minute. If we don't have that, you know, immunity from liability over what other people are doing there, we'd have to edit everything. We'd have to review everything. And that would mean the end of Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and chat boards and, oh, by the way, YouTube. And, hey, Greg, guess who owns YouTube? Google. You're right. And so, wait a second, Google is insisting, look, we cannot be held responsible for what other people choose to post on YouTube. And in case you're wondering, you know, just this morning I typed into Google, it took me about 10, you know, 10 seconds to find a, a video claiming Jews control the world and the Illuminati and all that kind of stuff. So is Google, you know, responsible for the content of their vi- those, those videos? I'm sure they'd say, hell no, we, we, we never looked at that. We have no idea what people are putting up on our sites. But they expect the Federalists to know what other people are comment are saying on their sites. And they'll hold the owners and publishers and editors of the Federalists responsible for what other people post in the comment section. And oh, by the way, if somebody can have their site demonetized by having somebody posting some awful racist stuff in the comment section, what have you just created a giant incentive for, Greg? For people to nefariously go in and leave racist comments on sites they don't like. You got it. They basically would say, hey, you know, at this point, you can get any site you don't like taken down by going into the comment section and posting horrible stuff. You, you, you have ironically created a giant incentive. And look, you know, as we've learned, it's not like anyone would ever fake a hate crime. You know, but anyway, so here we, we have this. So fears that, you know, they're saying, well, okay, now we, we've warned them. Uh, it looks like they're taking it down. You know, Google kind of backtracked a great deal from this. The verification unit insists they had the story correct, and then Google changed its mind. By the way, the interesting thing is that the Center for Countering Digital Hate said that, you know, these two sites, among a bunch of others, uh, published with our racist articles about the protests and projected the websites would make millions of dollars from Google. I should say this like Dr. Evil, millions of dollars for Google ads. <laughs> now, Greg, I don't know how Radio America is doing, but... Um, People probably notice, and that's review, we rattle the can for donations all the time. <laughs> if we're making millions of dollars through Google ads, they're hiding it from me. And I'd be a little irked about that. I'm fairly certain that we're not. I'm pretty good. There's some avenue from revenue from Google ads. But you'd rather have it than not have it. But um, if any of his buddies been running around telling you, look, the way to build your fortune is to write for conservative websites because of all that money that's flowing in from Google ads. Yeah, don't, uh, don't count on that. So again, you know, and this is where everyone's going to jump in and say, oh, you know, Jim, when you guys are compl- on the right are complaining about censorship, you don't realize censorship only means when the government, look, there's a common thread that's going to run through a bunch of our martinis today. And a big question is that when you have these de facto monopolies in the world of tech and in our, our media, like there are other sites that you can share videos on, but let's face it, YouTube is where people you know, mostly do that. That's, that's the, the main, the, the big main one. Um, stalking your old classmates, that's what Facebook is for. I'm sorry, or, you know, connecting to people that way. <laughs> Twitter, you know, I mean, the, the, the president has a Facebook account. I'm sure the president has an Instagram account, but you never hear about what he's doing through those. It's the Twitter account that everybody's like, oh my God, did you see what the president did today, right? Now, on paper, you'd be able to say, oh, okay, well, if I don't like Twitter's rules, I can go off and, you know, go use another one or something like that. But how did all of these social media institutions set themselves up? We give you a voice, we let you decide. We let you post what you want to post. And all of a sudden, these companies are saying, yeah, no, actually, we've decided we don't. <laughs> We're not going to let you have a voice. We're going to let you comment stuff as long as we approve or as long as it doesn't irk the Center for Countering Digital Hate. Yes, this is not a matter of government censorship. But maybe what we need a consensus on is if you express an opinion that other people disagree with or a controversial opinion, what should the, pro- the consequences be? This used to be a country where, where you, could have, you could be a banker and also be a member of the Flat Earth Society. And everyone would be like, huh, that's weird. And then they would go on and their question would be, okay, are you, are you going to approve of my loan or not? Right? There was a question of like, 
what you did for a living was not necessarily tied in with your viewpoints. And all of a sudden it's turned into, no, no, no. If this person has this viewpoint, we can't let them work at, uh, at IBM or Google or, or any of these companies. We can't let them uh, pollute our, our you know, we, we need to isolate them. We need to send them off into a fringe because really nothing could go wrong by pushing people off into the fringe and, uh, and all that stuff. They certainly couldn't thrive and they certainly couldn't spread and you, all that kind of stuff. We need to have be able to say, okay, you have that opinion. I myself may disagree and I may express my disagreement in some way. I may tell you you're an idiot or something. I may or may not choose to, to participate in your business. I may choose to go to the store across the street if you won't bake a cake for the gay wedding or something like that. But this idea of let's, let's put together an organized campaign. Let's do our biggest, our single best thing we can do to eliminate other people's ability to make a living because they have beliefs that disagree with us has unleashed something really destructive in our country. And as a great irony of this, we're going to see another flip side of this in our next martini. Well, let's move on to the crazy martini, which you so beautifully set up there. <laughs> and uh, let's move to the NFL and Roger Goodell. ESPN has gotten back to its nauseatingly political self in the wake of everything that's happened in the last few weeks. And given the fact that there's almost no live sports right now other than NASCAR and now the PGA Tour is back, they got to fill their time with something. So I'm going to cut them a little more slack than normal. But their, their take on everything is pretty much what we've come to expect from ESPN. But uh, Mike Greenberg... Uh, hosted a series of interviews with commissioners and other figures from the major sports leagues talking about eventually getting back uh, to playing. And one of the folks he had on was NFL commissioner Roger Goodell, and he's uh, committed to making sure, and so are the owners, he says, of uh, moving forward not only with money but activism on on some of these uh, racial issues that he says have uh, gone unaddressed for too long. But, of course, with the NFL, the issue came up eventually to Colin Kaepernick and what his role is in the game going forward, either on the field or off. Here's Greenberg and then Goodell's response. You've mentioned Colin Kaepernick's name multiple times in this conversation. What role do you envision him playing going forward with the National Football League, be it as a player or in any other way? How, how do you see him factoring in into the future? Well, listen, uh, if he wants to resume his career uh, in the NFL, um, that obviously is going to take a team to make that decision, but I welcome that, uh, support the club making that decision and encourage them to do that. Um, if his efforts are not on the field, but and continuing to work in this space, uh, we welcome to that, to that table and, and to be able to help us and guide us and help us make better decisions about the kinds of things that need to be done in communities. Uh, we have invited him in before and we want to make sure that uh, everybody's welcome at that table and trying to help us deal with some very complex, difficult issues that have been around, unfortunately, for a long time. Jim, this is uh, interesting that uh, Goodell's almost begging owners to sign Colin Kaepernick at this point. But even if they don't sign him, uh, it's almost like he's seating the floor to Colin Kaepernick to be the, uh, the leader of the band here. And given uh, Kaepernick's statements, verbal and otherwise, over the years, uh, that might be a bridge too far. But what do you make of Goodell groveling here? Well, first of all, right as we started taping, Greg, uh, Deanna Rossini of ESPN uh, reported the Chargers are the first team to publicly share that Colin Kaepernick is on their summer workout list for this upcoming season. Uh, this does not necessarily guarantee that they will sign him, but it indicates they've invited him for a workout. We'll see if, you know, Kaepernick shows and all that stuff. So from the beginning, people, a lot of people said, you know, Jim, you know, aren't you guys hypocrites? Well, the thing is, I, you know, I, I don't, I disagree strongly with some of the things Colin Kaepernick said. I don't like, I think if you're worried about police brutality, you really shouldn't run around wearing a t-shirt of Fidel Castro. You probably should look, if you don't like what American cops are doing, take a look at what the Chinese, <laughs> what, the, what the Cuban uh, uh, police are doing, down to political prisoners down there. You know, the, the cops are pig socks. I mean, Colin Kaepernick has done a lot to undermine his, uh, his argument and his support. But it's a free country. He's free to say whatever he wants. The National Football League has, hired, has him uh, hired all kinds of odd people and crazy guys over the years. Um, I was surprised when I looked this up, Greg. Do you know that O.J. Simpson has a standing invitation to all NFL uh, Hall of Fame induction ceremonies because he's a Hall of Fame member? Not surprising. I'm guessing he's I, mean, I guess the, the NFL just, just couldn't give up that slashing style that Simpson was famous for. But, Ouch. Uh, but, you know, the point being that, you know, the NFL, like, should somebody lose their job because they have a controversial viewpoint? And 
you know, people have always said, well, you know, if there, look, this did, if a lot of people suspect that it's not coincidental that Kaepernick, you know, started taking this stance and became more outspoke, outspoken about political and social views after a rocky couple of seasons in which he, you know, lost his starting job to Blaine Gabbert. Mm-hmm. I did not just make up that name. That is a real quote. Well, I'm making air quotes as I say real. This is an actual human being who has played quarterback in the NFL. <laughs> So there were some people who had the suspicion that Kaepernick became more interested in being a uh, political figure or social movement leader than he had, was interested in being a quarterback, and this is why he didn't get signed. Now, it's also pretty likely when you look at all the various folks who have started in the NFL quarterback and who have not performed well, was he blacklisted? It certainly does seem that, you know, that there was a, a great deal of players who were reluctant, a great deal of owners who were reluctant to hire him. Some were a little more outspoken about it than others. And, but the other interesting thing is, so there's always been this question of, was Kaepernick not getting an opportunity because he was politically controversial or turned into a lightning rod? Or was it because he just wasn't as good as he used to be and he was going to want big money and he expected to be paid like a top tier quarterback, et cetera, et cetera. Well, hopefully someday we'll have a chance to see for ourselves. There was that uh, tryout opportunity where Kaepernick didn't like the conditions and changed it at the last second and went to a different location. Some scouts went to the other uh, locations. Some did not. Look, there's one aspect of this uh, whole controversy that's been an open question. Can Kaepernick still play quarterback well? Obviously, his fans and supporters say, yes, of course. And the only reason anybody's not hiring him is because of racism and and payback for his statements. And and I guess that could be the case. Or maybe he's just not as good as he used to be. Let's see. And if, you know, Kaepernick goes out there and he throws, he's remarkably accurate. He's throwing bombs and he's still able to scramble and he's as good as he ever was. All right. Then that really does point in the direction of teams not wanting to hire him for his viewpoints. And that does look like a, uh, uh, an example of injustice. If it, if he goes out in preseason and he goes three for 12 and throws some interceptions and sacks and all that stuff, well, then maybe, no, maybe it really was in the end that he just wasn't as good as he used to be. And all of this was sort of distracting from the fact that, you know, he couldn't get it done on the field the way that uh, he once was able to. I'd really like to have that answer. I, I remember the first time we discussed this controversy, a lot, of my list, a lot of my readers and perhaps some of our listeners believed they so vehemently disagreed with Colin Kaepernick that they wanted to see him blacklisted. They wanted to ensure that he would never play again. They believed they were so offended and they were so outraged by his decision to kneel during the national anthem. By golly, they never wanted to see that player play again. Greg, I know I, res- I disrespectfully disagree. I think if you really don't like Kaepernick, then you want him back in the league. You want him back in the huddle and you want him under, you know, sit- standing under center, taking that snap and just getting creamed by a blitzing linebacker. And you want to boo him. You want to, you know, you want to, you know, in other words, like, you know, to me, you know, look, it's, it's okay to uh, disagree with guys. But when we start saying, no, he should not be able to make a living because of his viewpoints. Well, then we turn into the same kind of people who want to demonetize and shut down the Federalist because of the viewpoints it espouses. Here's my question about Colin Kaepernick, Jim. And I could be wrong on this. I'm happy to be educated on this. Other than kneeling, what exactly has Colin Kaepernick done to change the relationship between the police and the people that they are supposed to protect and serve? Um, well, he's inspired some Nike ads, right? <laughs> is he talking to police? Is he getting people together to have conversations? Is he coming up with ideas and, and, and groups to actually foster better relations and, and improve things? I mean, what other than getting attention for kneeling, what has he done? He may have done stuff. I just don't know about it. Maybe that's on him. Maybe it's on the people who are covering him. We'll, we'll, uh, you know, actually, now, now that you've asked that question, I want to dig into it, Greg. Jim, see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus, Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Don't forget to take two minutes over at Gabby.com slash Martini and find out how much you can save on your car and homeowner's insurance. Gabby.com slash Martini. Don't forget to subscribe to the Three Martini Lunch. Leave us a kind review. Also get us on those home devices. Just say play three martini lunch podcast and tune in on Thursday for the next three martini lunch.